Good afternoon. I was just wondering, maybe it wasn't a smart idea to criticize neoliberalism in front of an audience at a TED event hosted at a business school. But then again, I thought, well, this is an event about paradigm shifts, so here we go. We all have beliefs that we deeply believe in that guide our thinking, our decision making. When those beliefs are shared by society, they are called an orthodoxy. Now, according to the Cambridge Dictionary, the current orthodoxy, the current economic orthodoxy, is the one that is generally accepted by society of free markets and unregulated trade. Now, each orthodoxy is always a reductionism. It's a simplification, if you like. Reality is more complex. That means an orthodoxy may hit an expiration date when it's no longer productive, when experiences day to day of a lot of people don't match anymore the beliefs of the orthodoxy. My basic premise today is that neoliberalism is at that point in time where it's hitting its expiration date. Now, all of us have grown up, have lived, more or less everybody, as I can see in this room, given their age, in the times of neoliberalism. But it hasn't always been that way. In fact, prior to um, neoliberalism, there was Keynesianism. And it was only in 1947 that Friedrich August Hayek and Milton Friedman convened leading thinkers of the world around um, Mont Pelerin in Switzerland to start thinking we need a new orthodoxy. And it took more than a generation for that orthodoxy to mature, to be generally accepted. Nowadays, however, we can say that is the dominant orthodoxy. However, there are more and more signs of stress that this orthodoxy is no longer productive. And the question for business leaders that I want to address today is what should they do about that? Let's briefly set the stage by reviewing what are the core philosophical beliefs behind neoliberalism. First of all, society is assumed to be made up of rational individuals that seek to maximize their own utility, the famous homo economicus. And that, that ideal of the homo economicus also means that being rational, competition is the primary driver of human affairs. And in fact, the right to compete is the essence of liberty, according to neoliberalism. And the success of a nation, then, is the sum of all the utilities. And that is usually measured in a measure like GDP. And the proper role of governments is kind of to make sure that the free markets are protected, but not overregulated. Now, let's be clear, over the last 50 years, Neoliberalism had had, has had a good run, if you measure it in terms of GDP growth. We've seen amazing growth rates. Billions of people have been taken out of extreme poverty, and millions of people have become very, very rich. We've seen growth rates that have translated into lower job, um, jobless rates that have translated also into low interest rates. So you could say, neoliberalism has worked. However, not only has income and wealth grown, also has inequality grown. Now, the scope of the market-based thinking has reached far beyond economics. It's not only fiscal policy, trade policy, it's also labor policy. It's um, the policies that govern our education sector, even the healthcare sector, that are nowadays influenced, deeply influenced by market-based thinking and neoliberalism. Companies basically assume that neoliberalism and the basic beliefs of neoliberalism as they stand here will continue. They will be the basis for their strategies. Strategy consultants that I was part of in a, in a past life have turned the neoliberal beliefs into hammers that turn the whole world into a nail. And if you look at the financial sector and corporate governance, they are deeply infused by these beliefs. But even more amazingly, the mainstream political parties in almost all Western societies have embraced the primacy of the markets as the first means of getting something done. And that means you find um, in more progressive left 
left uh, policies um, of Obama in the Affordable Care Act or in Tony Blair's um, reforms of the National Health Service, the same market-based mechanisms that you would expect from conservative governments around the world. Now, there are, however, signs of stress. And the situation is such that I'm reminded a bit of Hans Christian Andersen's tale of the emperor uh, who has got new clothes. The story goes like this. Two weavers come to the emperor and promise the emperor that they can furnish him with the most amazing clothes. They are most amazing because they are invisible to everybody who is stupid, incompetent, or not fit for the job. Right? As you can imagine, it didn't take them a lot of work to kind of fashion those clothes. But when they did, the emperor wears those clothes, goes out, and nobody dares to show that he or she is stupid, incompetent, or not fit for the job. Until a child says, hey, the emperor is wearing no clothes. And I think we have this situation when it comes to neoliberalism. If we look carefully, if we listen, almost with a child's eye, to what is happening in the world, uh, with a child's ear, we should listen and watch with a child's eye. Now, the first emperor that I see without clothes is the emperor of the rising tide and justice. According to neoliberalism, the rising tide will lift the boat and we will have more and more people in a good position. However, as I said before, income inequality has also risen, not just income. Today, if you look at income, 8% of the top income earners own more than half of the global income. When you look at wealth, it's even worse, if you like. 1% uh, own much more than half of the wealth of the world. And if you look at consumption, it also gets interesting. The lower, poorer billion people on this planet consume 1%, whereas the, richer, the richest 1 billion consume about three quarters of all resources. So that means we have an in, an, um, a set of divides that creates also political and economic tensions. And those divides are turning to become more and more relevant as it means that people don't trust anymore the elites who have been the main narrators of the uh, neoliberal paradigm. That means those who feel left behind, those who are not living in the metropolitan cities, who are not educated, who don't have the new skills, they are shouting very loudly, this emperor of the, ri of the rising tide and justice has no clothes. The second emperor is the emperor of the commons. I've spent six years of my life working on climate change as the CEO of the European Climate Foundation. And I've become acutely aware of the situation of the, that's called the tragedy of the commons and the tragedy of the horizons when it comes to our atmosphere and our oceans. Now, clearly, we are at a point where if we continue <clears throat> business as usual, we are facing existential risks of tipping points in the climate. And they have a moral dimension because the reasons are man-made, our man-made emissions. That is a moral dimension that means also that a lot of people say, well, what are we going to do about it? And it's a cruel joke, as Jared Diamond has pointed out, if we tell developing nations, you can have it our way if only you embrace the neoliberal orthodoxy and you'll be fine. That is simply not true. So those who, left, who feel they are left behind on the environmental side, who don't have uh, our background, also say, well, something needs to happen. Fridays for Future and Extinction Rebellion are shouting, the emperor has no clothes. And the third emperor I want to point out, point out is the emperor of transactional efficiency. When you think about it, markets have a tendency to simplify things. They turn relations into transactions. And then the imperative is to make those transactions more efficient. And that means we invest into more of the internet, more of automation, more of robotics, more of AI, and it's an imperative, has a huge force of efficiency behind it. However, on the way, we are at the risk of losing something because human relations are more than transactions. And even if some people think they have a template for friendship on Facebook 
or for love on Tinder, they are missing the essence of it. So those people who are highly talented, who have a lot of choice, are the first to recognize that that reductionism of the transactional focus that comes with neoliberalism is not enough. The new work movement of people who are talented, who have choice, is essentially saying we want purpose. We want a share in the deeper dimensions of relationships. We want space uh, where meaning can be created. And they are shouting the emperor of transactional efficiency in the workplace has no clothes. So, if you are now a business leader and you buy into my argument that there are signs that neoliberalism may be coming towards, may be coming closer towards its expiration date, what should a business leader do? Now, when I was thinking about that question, I was reminded of a time when I was in the IT industry running a large IT services company called CompuNet, Computer AG, about 20 years ago. That was the time of the dot-com boom, but also of the dot-com bust. And when the dot-com bust happened, everything imploded. Our business models imploded, our assumptions on how we were going to be successful, our metrics fell apart. It was really, really painful and terrible. So the question was at that time, what can we do now that we didn't know what the future would bring, what the new business model would look like, what can you do if you don't want to just panic? And the, the solution was to say, well, we need to focus on heuristics, of rules of thumb that give us a focus on the essentials. It's a bit like when you're climbing a mountain, you can think about the mountain all the time, or you can really focus on getting good at climbing. So, and we had very simple rules, like don't lose your best people in the crisis. That was rule number one. Second one, reach out to customers all the time. Go the extra miles with the uh, customers and stay on top of cash flow. If you do those three things, you're probably going to survive whatever happens. Now, I don't believe the heuristics with regard to the transition beyond neoliberalism will be anywhere close that simple. However, let me propose three heuristics that might be helpful. The first is you need to listen to diverse voices. That may sound obvious, but a lot of business leaders live in a bubble. They don't talk to people who are not their friends. They don't talk to people who think differently. I believe that the Bayer Monsanto deal might have looked differently if there had been a Greenpeace member on their board. So how do you get those people that think differently from you into your orbit, listen to them? That is important. And it also means you need to start thinking beyond your traditional metrics. The normal business leader has goals in terms of EBITDA, market share, revenue growth, you name it. And they are necessary, necessary for getting things done. However, they don't provide purpose. They don't provide the deeper meaning that is necessary to move beyond neoliberalism. So instead of homo economicus, we need diverse voices that help us find new narratives of belonging, what we ought to do of meeting. The second heuristic is to reduce the fragility of the system. Now, whenever a system, an organization, a society becomes more fragile, there are early warning indicators. Debt, in the case of an organization, is a good warning indicator. Environmental catastrophes, extreme weather events, in, our, in the case of the climate, they are warning indicators that the system is becoming more fragile. Now, you can turn that around and say anything that helps you to make the system less fragile or even anti-fragile is good, moves you in the right direction. Now, that could be by stress testing. It could be done by stress testing your business models against possible regulation, against different environments. So I would argue any business leader that is invested in, in the fossil fuel industry should stress, stress test his or her business model against a $100 carbon price along the whole supply chain. And then we would see that renewable energy concepts, the circular economy, are much more valuable and robust ideas than uh, lobbying for the status quo extension. So, Fragility is a good early warning indicator, helping systems become robust, making them 
resilient is a, is a morally and from a business point of view sound strategy. The final heuristics I want to point out is to avoid polarization. Now, why is that important? We have a tendency to reduce problems to poles, either or. And let me just point at three poles that are difficult, but that need a different resolution than just saying it's an either or. There is the question of equality versus innovation. That calls, if you want to resolve it, for a dynamic view on equality, not the one we have today, where there's an attracting barrier. Once you've reached a certain wealth, well, you're kind of safe because you're beyond the barrier. That will have to change. Another interesting pole uh, uh, dichotomy to poles is the question of personal, individual development versus solidarity. Now, that is an interesting one because actually modern psychology has very scientifically and very soundly demonstrated that we can only develop in community with the help of community. To think that personal achievement um, at the expense of family and community, at the expense of purpose, is good enough, is psychologically flawed. And a third one, which is actually probably the most interesting one at this point in time, is the question of competition versus cooperation and the role of the state. I believe that we need to take a much broader view on the role of the common goods and then ask the question, what can states and governments do to help with the production of common goods? Now, that calls for deep public-private partnerships, which is very, very different from the shallow industrial policies and lobbying we often see today. So to conclude, neoliberalism, from my point of view, is nearing its, its expiration date very fast. Business leaders cannot just hope that that process will happen also very quickly. It will take a long time. During that time, there will be a lot of different options. There will, it will be messy. It will be contextual. It will not be just one solution that comes around the corner and be visible at one point in time. So dealing with that uncertainty means heuristics have a role to play. And let me end with one last heuristic, and that is the heuristic of developing the courage to let go of the present and the past. The most difficult part is probably to accept that all of this, moving beyond neoliberalism, involves changes in our lifestyle, in our business models, and our leadership modes. However, if we do have that courage to let go, I'm convinced that there is an exciting and very constructive space beyond neoliberalism. Thank you very much.